Welcome back. Well, as you can see, I have a photobomb kitty here with me, and you may hear that dripping sound in the background. That's my coffee. So, got my kitty, got my coffee coming. We're all set to go, and we're going to finish up our lamp today. All right, we'll see you in a minute. coffee. I've got a little photo bomb kitty laying at my feet on the floor and I've got everything I need to go. So let's do a little housekeeping first. One, safety glasses. And notice, no chill. Well, I've got earrings on, but I, I don't plan to stick my head in the lamp, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. No necklaces, no bracelets, nothing that can get caught up in this because these are safety issues. All my glasses, by the way, are safety glasses. Usually when I'm doing a project like this, I switch out my glasses. It's just a little reminder to me to mention that they're safety glasses, but as I say, they all are. Uh, and that's because uh, I've never met a project I didn't love. Consequently, I can't walk past a screwdriver without wanting to grab it and fix something, tighten something. So whatever glasses are, are on the end of my nose need to be safety glasses. So that's number one when we talk about safety. And number two, we're going to talk about this. This is oh, and this is a translucent silver cord. And we discussed this when we were ordering parts. This is a relatively recent cord. They didn't have cords like this five years ago. They had translucent gold, but translucent silver is new. I'm doing that as a favor to whoever may end up rewiring this lamp 50, 60 years from now. Because if you look at the vase, the vase is 100 years old or more. We have the little stand, which is hand-turned, 40 or 50 years old at least. Because it's hand-turned, it could be a lot older than that. And you're never going to be able to tell because it's hand-turned. Our brass is all unfinished, it's just, just plain unfinished brass. So it will acquire a patina over time. Um, at the finish will dull, oh, including these pieces. And pieces like this have been made for many decades. So you look at that and nothing is going to say to you, oh, well, I guess this is. Nope, it's all going to be um, it's all going to look as if it could have been put together in the 1930s, except for this. So I'm hoping this heads up will be valuable to someone many years from now, just as an indication of, well, this is when that cord was put in, because we use many, many indicators to inform ourselves of how old a lamp is and in the case of this lamp in part because I am putting it together because the crazy lamp lady gave me the vase. This is a question of well, we're doing this in something of an old-fashioned way. We want a timeless style. But I want to make sure that when somebody is actually looking at the electrical parts, they're getting some indication of when it was wired. Uh, and that could be a safety issue. People might want to know, uh, is this wire, is this UL? I don't have, this is UL approved by the way, but I don't have that little UL tag on the cord. Um, usually that is one of those uh, uh, direct to consumer things. You buy the lamp, the UL tag is on the cord. You buy the parts and you know, they assume if you're buying lamp parts you're pretty clear about the UL status of your cord. So, last time 
we had uh, our S cluster. Oh. And remember when I took it apart, it had a little part like this that was rusted on to the pipe. Couldn't get it off. Fortunately, I have one of these little, actually I have like 30 of these little parts. So I don't have any trouble fitting a little part in there. Um, and that's when it comes in handy to have some common, commonly used lamp parts. And lamp parts, the common ones, are different if you make lamps from scratch than if you make lamps from cannibalized parts. You wouldn't have a piece like this if you just made lamps from scratch. But when you're cannibalizing, this is a reducer. It takes a larger pipe and converts it to a smaller pipe, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, is a very common problem when you're working with scavenged parts. Not everything is the size you wish it would be. So this is what we had up here. But for now, we are setting that aside. So here's our cord, and I've tried to straighten it out a little. And this is our little hole. You see the washer, and then we have the nut, and then within that we have our threaded rod. What I am going to do to this, remember, this is the front. The first thing I am going to do is feed this cord. And I'll show you as soon as I get it in there and can pick it up again. I'm feeding it through one of the openings in this little stand. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out enough cord so that I can easily get to the top. And now I'm going to tie a knot in this. Now, tying it tight, it's just a loose knot. All right. Can you see how loose that knot is? That's fine. I will tighten it later. Now, oh, and that's an important step. Do not forget that step. I'll show you what that's all about when we get to it. Cord is going to be fed through our threaded rod that's running right up the center of the lamp. Are we out there? Yes, we are. All right. And here is our cord. Now, we need enough cord to go all the way through this little pipe and come out the top. Now the top, if you'll recall, has, and this was from our video on cannibalizing the lamp for parts. We have two little wire caps that are holding the wires together. One wire from this side is being held against the matching wire from this side, and then one wire from this side is being held uh, with the matching wire. And that's okay because we know, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Right now what I have to do I have to get this little bugger through. And this is a very tiny little space here. So, and I have to make sure that I have enough clearance to get that through, come through, come through, come through. All right, we lost one of our wire caps. That's okay. Here we go. Come on. Yes, there you are. Oh, you're so exciting. All right, and now I'm going to screw this in. Um, and we're going to come down on our side. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to prop this up. Let's see. 
see if we can do that. No. We need to prop that up like this. There we go. All right. Now, let's see if we can get this around so that you can... Okay. I see what we're doing. We're coming at that from the wrong angle. I want to make sure you can see into this little cubby. Now, we have wires here. We are going to make our UL knot. I am concerned that we've got a very tight area, but we're going to make the UL knot anyway. And I'll bet you remember how it's done. Mouse ears. Okay. Loop in front. Loop in back. Okay. Front, back. Back through front. Front through back. Pull. And that's our knot. Now, mm. And we have to be cautious with that because, as I say, it's going into a very, very small area. That area is not going to want to get crammed full of wires, but we have to do it. So the next thing we have to do, and I'm going to have to move this over here so that I can see it because this is, this is all visual. Um, when we are working with our wire, remember one of our wires is ridged and one of our wires is not. Um, our non-ridged wire, we're referring to that as bald, just like a bald tire. Our ridged wire, we can just ignore that for a moment because our mnemonic is associated with the bald wire. Whenever you have wires like this, one side is ridged, one side is bald. It's important because our plug, where is our plug? Our plug is polarized. Notice that one little foot of this plug is bigger than the other. And that is so each little foot goes into the proper opening on the outlet. Because of that, you need to match up these cords properly. So, we're sticking with our Bs. Black bald brass. Our bald wire will connect to the black wire, if there is one, or to the brass terminal. That's just an electrician's way of saying screw. Terminal just means ending. It's from Latin terminus. So, um, black ball brass, brass screw, bald wire, black wire. Now what's going to happen here is because our fixture was already pre-wired. There, there are wires in here that are snaking through the arm and coming out here. And each one, each, there are two wires hooked together just like this. Two wires here, two wires here. One wire is bald, one wire is ridged. One wire is bald, one wire is ridged. When they meet here in our little cubby, our tiny little spot here, the ridged wire from this uh, light socket is connected to the ridged wire from this. And the bald wire from this is connected to the bald wire from this. This is my ridged wire, and it needs to connect to the two ridged wires here. Bald wire needs to connect to the two bald wires. This is important. Uh, like, the house fire important. So, that's why we put so much time and energy into that mnemonic. Black, bald, brass. Always hook them up properly. Uh, our UL knot. The reason we want the knot, this is another safety issue. When I pull the slack out of this wire when we're through, this knot is going to keep 
this part of the wire, the connections, from sliding down the cord, pulling free, and you know, possibly hot wires smashing into one another and causing shorts and, you know, again, electrical wires, electrical fires. It's an issue. But this is going to serve to mechanically stop that from going through. And we've got another knot on the bottom that's going to do the same thing for a different reason. So what I am going to do right now is I am going to take a look at these little wires and see which one is, is the, the bald one and which one is the ridged one. So for that, the glasses have to come off. Ha! All right. Good. Ridged. All right. Now I know what I'm hooking up. So I'm going to yank a little bit of this out and I'm going to loosen my little UL knot, my mouse ears. Unfortunately, I just don't have very much room in here. Wish I did. What do I have this sitting on? There. And I have my little wire cap. Okay. Now this would be a lot easier if I had a little extra wire to play with. But because this was wired in a factory for assembly in a factory, that's one of the downsides of cannibalizing parts. It was not really done to make my life easy or to make the life of anyone who would be subsequently working on it easy. This was done to keep costs as low as possible for the manufacturer of the lighting. So now I just need to get this into my little um, wire cap. So what I'm doing is I've got all three wires. Uh, right now, it's the um, the bald wires from both the uh, the elect uh, the outlet uh, elect sockets. There we go, light sockets, along with the bald wire from our silver cord. And I just need to get this caught up. And what I'm going to do, because I just dropped a part on the floor, is I'm going to pause you for a moment, because this is boring, and as you can see, gee, it's not coming easily. I'll show you when I get it done. Okay, so I got my little parts all stuck in there. Now, here we are. This is the cap that fits on top. Now, this is going to be somewhat difficult because I've got a lot of stuff crammed in there. Um, I've got wires, I've got wire caps, and I just need to get those little buggers all shoved in.
And I don't think they really want to do this, but I'm forcing them. Yes, you're all going in there. I don't care if you don't like it. And again, my concern with this from the start was I had a lot of wires to shove into a very tiny little piece of, of lamp. All right. So, voila. Now, let's come over here and look at this. Remember I told you we were going to deal with our knot in the bottom. Now, I'm pulling this out. I want this knot to tighten up somewhere between here and here. Uh, the reason for that is it's going to make sure that if somebody grabs the lamp by the cord, not saying anybody's going to do that, but suppose they do, or suppose they trip over the cord, they're not going to accidentally pull all the wiring out, you know, possibly causing a short, possibly causing an electrical fire. So, now comes the litmus test. We are going to see if, in fact, we've got this wired properly. All right, we are plugged in. We've got bulbs. Alright, this one had been turned on, so yes, we have light. Let's check this one too, because remember, those were separate connections. Okay, we have a working lamp. Now, this piece or any kind of length of threaded rod can go right in here at the top along with this piece which is our shade rest. Our shade rest will go on the topmost end of our threaded rod and it will accommodate a standard spider shade. A spider shade um, is the ordinary lampshade that we use in the United States. Drops on top, you, you secure it with your finial. It's called a spider shade um, because the arms branch out. I, I suppose it looks like a spider. Not to me, but hey, nobody consulted me when they started picking these names. This piece right here is going to determine how tall our shade is. This piece is about, uh, about eight inches. This one is about six inches. Now, between the two of them, we've got 14 inches, and the shade will come to about here, roughly. We want a little bit of space between the top of the lamp and the bottom of the shade, because we need to get in and be able to turn our lamp on and off. And of course we have all our decorative parts plus all the pretty decoration inside the rim of the vase. And we want to show that off. So that is going to be a 14 inch shade. If I wanted to go a little less, I could reduce the length of this. Now when I do that, I would replace this because as I mentioned, this is threaded only on the two ends. What I would do is I would cut whatever length I needed from a, a plain threaded rod. And the reason for that is the rod would be completely hidden by the lampshade. I don't need anything fancy like this pretty reeded brass piece. It can be anything. You're not going to see it. And that will um, allow me to use whatever size shade I want. 
Now, the reason that becomes important is because I might want to use an antique shade on this. Um, I might want to use something special. And I need the flexibility to accommodate a shade. Now, can I use a 7 or 8 inch shade on this? No. We discussed that when we were talking about how to size your shade to your lamp. This is about 14, 15 inches from the top of the table to about here. Uh, so we're looking roughly at a 14 inch shade because when we talked about um, sizing the shade to the lamp, we said we want our shade to be roughly the same size as the base of our lamp. And that this is the base of our lamp. That looks best. Is it carved in stone? No, it's not. With a lamp this large, we can get away with a shorter shade. Um, in fact, we might look at that and say, well, you know, 14 inches is just, it's crazy big. And at that point, we're looking at a three foot tall lamp because we'd have 28 inches between the lamp and the shade, and then three or four inches in between and three or four inches with the finial and well, we're just going to town. That might seem a little excessive. A lamp like this, we could probably do a 10, 12 inch shade easily enough. Would I go down to an eight? No, I would not. Um, but a 10 might work if it were the right shade. But since we're actually going to look at making a shade, we're going to have some options. So my hands are filthy. But my cat is happy. My lamp is working. I'm going to have to text Jocelyn and let her know because this is why she gave me this. She knew what this was going to become. And I remember a lot of people saying, well, why are you going to turn that into a lamp? It's like, because it wasn't given to me by the crazy vase lady. It was given to me by the crazy lamp lady. So you know where it has to be. Anyway, uh, and I know why she gave me this. It's a beautiful old piece, and it goes really, really well in my bedroom. So I know where this is going. She knows where this is going. She knew where this was going the minute she pulled this out of the dingy old bin or whatever she found it in. So we're good. So seeing as this was actually a little faster than I thought it would be, I'm going to give you another quick eBay story, and I'm surprised I didn't think of this when I was doing those little eBay stories yesterday. This is a buyer story. There is a scam in here somewhere, but I don't know what it is. So here's what happened. Um, a couple of years ago, I bought a, a small portable electric heater. Um, I bought it in January, um, and oh, let me cast back. The reason I bought the small electrical heater is every year I go off and I get myself a Christmas present, just something that I want that nobody else would think to get for me. I get it for myself. And two years ago, it was a little Roomba, a little robot that just, you know, it, it vacuums up your dust and amuses your cat all day while you're gone which with my cat is very important because Audie needs a toy. So the Roomba I got was apparently completely illegal. It wasn't working when I got it. And that's when I found out that the manufacturer insisted it had never been legally sold. Uh, I got it on eBay, by the way. Um, it had never been legally sold. They were not standing behind it. It sort of fell off the back of a truck when no one was looking. Whoa. Well, eBay gave me my money back immediately because I gave them the phone number of the manufacturer and said, you call them if you don't believe me. And I'm guessing they did. Um, yeah, it was, it was an illegal sale start to finish. Uh, and that had never happened to me before. 
So I had my birthday money sitting around. And in January, I said, well, it's not glamorous, but I'll get myself a little electric heater because I can put that in the kitchen right next to Audie's cat tree. And that will keep him comfortable in the winter because he'll have his own little source of heat right at the foot of his cat tree. And he should like that because Audie frequently sits in front of the little electric heater and watches it as if he were watching a television show. Sometimes I really don't think he's all that bright. Anyway, so I ordered the heater again from eBay. Um, I got the heater and it had my name and address on the box, but it said at the top, you know, um, I'm just going to make a name up, um, Michelle Johnson, care of Sue Hamilton and my name and address. Well, I thought that was a little odd. I didn't know why Michelle Johnson's name would be on my box, but seeing as it was shortly after Christmas, my first thought was not, oh my God, crazy scammers, but gee, maybe Michelle Johnson got this for Christmas. She didn't want it and sold it on eBay. That happens all the time. So, no big deal. Uh, I, the box was factory sealed. When I saw someone else's name on it, I made sure of that. Factory sealed, I get my brand spanking new little heater out. I set it up next to Audie's cat tree. He goes over, watches it like he's watching television. And two days later, PayPal sends me a note saying that the amount I had paid for the heater had been credited back to my account. I thought that was very odd, so I called PayPal and said, wait a minute, this is a mistake. I got the item. I have no idea what would make you think I hadn't, you know, please give the money back to the seller. Then they said, oh, you don't understand. The seller refunded your money. Well, that was different. Why would they do that? This was, um, it, it was well over $100. I don't remember how much it was, but it wasn't a, a 10 or $15 item that you would casually make a refund over, especially since I hadn't asked for one. So um, I was at the point where I was trying to figure out what my next step would be when I get an email from the seller. And the seller, uh, the person who sent me the email, um, and we're going to call him Bob Smith. Bob Smith says, there was a problem with my PayPal account. Could you please send the money to another account? Well, okay. At this point, he's got my attention. The other account is in the name of Jim Jones. Um, Oh, by the way, I'm just making these names up. Nobody's drinking Kool-Aid in this. It's just uh, because we have three separate people at this point. We've got Michelle, who uh, was the person on the label that came to my house with the heater. Um, we've got Bob, who is writing to me saying, I sent you your money back. Can you send it to Jim's account? And, of course, we've got Jim. So at that point... Um, I wrote him back and I just one line and I said, who's Michelle Johnson? I never heard back from him after that because remember it was Michelle's name on the box. Never heard anything back from him, period. That's where it stopped. After a couple of days, I called PayPal and I said, look, I have a feeling there is some kind of scam. I do not know what it is. What kind of scam involves them giving me my money back? Um, well, it could very well be that most people are honest enough to say, yes, I will send the money wherever you want me to send it, um, or perhaps gullible enough. That was what PayPal said. Perhaps they were just uh, shuffling money from one account to another. There could have been any number of schemes going on. But as I say, there was a scam somewhere. I don't know what it is. 
because at this point, I have had this here for a year and a half. They refunded my money, and as soon as I asked them who Michelle Johnson was, never heard from them again. So I know something was up, um, and I got a free heater out of it. But it was enough to really make me nervous. So my advice is if you ever run into anything that is weird or creepy or you don't understand, talk to PayPal. And the reason for that is if anybody's going to know a scam, it's going to be PayPal. The average PayPal customer service rep probably sees two or three dozen scams every single day on the job. They will see more in 20 minutes than the rest of us will see in a lifetime because it all gets funneled through their offices sooner or later. So that was one and I thought we've got a little extra time. I'll tell you about that one. That is my free heater scam. But of course my free heater scam was right on the heels of my stolen Roomba scam. So you just don't know. Last Christmas was just not a good time for me at eBay. All right, we have our lamp and our next phase in this project is we are going to make the shade. All right, take care everybody. I will see you tomorrow. Stay safe, stay sane. I know it's just getting super, super crazy out there. Everybody's getting worried. Everybody's getting frightened. Just remember, we're all here, you know. Feel free to leave your comments. If you're scared, if you're upset, if you're nervous, throw that into the comments. No judgments. And by the way, in case you haven't noticed, my bangs are gone. For the duration, I have no bangs because I cannot maintain them out of my eyes and this is what I'm going to be looking like for a while until I can get somebody to cut it. Oh, and by the way, if I decide to cut it myself, I'm going to do it right on camera and you can watch me cut my... I know, blind lady cuts her own hair. Film at 11. See you tomorrow. <laughs>